recording. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're recording now and I'll, uh, I'll get started. So um, hello, everyone. It's lovely to have you all along this morning. Um, my name is Naomi, Naomi Davis. Um, like Linda said, I am an ecologist based in Aberystwyth. Um, and I'm here today to chat to you about hedgehogs, incidentally, one of my favorite animals. Um, so uh, that's, that's me with um, one of my little rescue hedgehogs. So I, I used to do a fair bit of um, rescue and fostering with the uh, rescue hedgehogs, which is something I'll get onto in a minute. But just a little bit about me and my background. Um, so I am a animal behavior graduate. So I went to university in Aberystwyth and studied um, animal behavior, mostly looking at birds, but mammals as well. Since graduating, I've been working with a variety of different charities, doing a bit of volunteer work and a bit of contract work with the RSPB and the wildlife trusts, but then also with the, the Hedgehog Society as well. Um, most recently, I've worked on the Pine Martin Reintroduction Project, which was a fantastic piece of work and definitely one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Um, and then at the moment, I focus a lot on bats. So I'm part of the North Caridagian Bat Group, and I also do a bit of bat care. So I moved from hedgehogs to bats because my, my flat's not that big and bats are a lot smaller than hedgehogs. Um, you can join me on Friday. Um, for a talk about um, bats of, uh, of Wales as well. And if you're uh, on, the, on the Twitter or on, or on social media, you can find me, my handle is uh, Natir Naomi. So that's nature spelt the Welsh way. Um, so yeah, so hedgehogs are um, one of our, I suppose, most iconic and unique species, um, tend to be loved by everyone, quite often comes on top whenever there's a poll about um, who's the favourite mammal of Britain, which is Britain's most iconic mammal, definitely the hedgehog, because it is a very, very iconic species and there, there is really nothing like it in the UK. So if we do a little breakdown of our fact file when it comes to hedgehogs, um, what we're going to do today is, I suppose, look a little bit about hedgehogs, about their ecology um, and about their lifestyle, and then sort of look about um, what has been affecting hedgehogs in terms of their decline and then a little bit about what you can do to help hedgehogs in your garden and your local green space. So just to get started we have the European hedgehog in Britain so that's Onaceus europaeus. They are the only spiny mammal that you can find in the UK. They are of course nocturnal which is probably why we don't see them very often and they hibernate in the winter months. And that has a lot to do with the temperature and external conditions. So it can be from October to March, but it can be just for December and January, depending on the temperature. And they tend to have only one litter, and that's born in the summer months around June, July and August. Now, so we have the Western European hedgehog. And this hedgehog can be found um, all over Western Europe from up in Scandinavia all the way down to the Iberian Peninsula in Spain and over into Italy and Western Europe, just bumping up against Russia, where you start getting the different European species. You can also find our, our species of hedgehog in New Zealand, because when the Brits went over there in the 1800s, they thought, hmm, what can we do to make this look more British? I know, let's bring some hedgehogs. And they literally brought over a load of hedgehogs to make everything look a bit more British. But unfortunately, this hasn't done so well for New Zealand because being an island, they don't really have any land predators. And so the hedgehogs have actually become quite a pest in New Zealand. Um, so if you ever see newspaper articles about hedgehogs becoming a pest, it's generally on island habitats and places where the wildlife hasn't adapted to, um, to land predators. And they also don't hibernate in New Zealand. So hedgehogs over there tend to be a little bit smaller, but because the winters aren't as harsh, they don't need to hibernate. So I find that quite interesting in terms of how one species has already started to evolve um, different strategies for, for living, depending on where it is. And so worldwide, there are actually 17 different species of hedgehog, or at least 17 that are alive at the moment. Um, they can be found all over the Northern Hemisphere. So, well, on the on the sort of European side, I should say. So Europe, Asia and Africa is generally the, um, the places where you can find hedgehogs. Quite a lot of um, ancient 
um, work around Egypt has found uh, quite a lot of interesting ceramic work with uh, lovely hedgehog designs there. So we know that they've been fond, humans have been fond of hedgehogs for, for a very long time. They've got a very iconic body shape. So these spines, um, this has been, uh, they've been using this strategy for about 15 million years. So their body shape hasn't really changed. It's quite primitive um, and nothing, uh, it hasn't really needed to adapt any further strategies for survival because its spiky ball does really, really well. And they're actually related to the shrew family and to a latter extent to the mole family. And so we found this out about 20 years ago when we uh, scientists did a bit more genetic work on hedgehogs. Um, and it's very interesting to see that that's who they're related to in terms of um, their evolution when they actually look a bit more like an echidna or something. But of course, that's a marsupial. And it just goes to show how, um, how convergent evolution can uh, evolve different strategies in completely different genetic groups. So spines clearly are a very good survival strategy. So when I say hedgehog and when I type in hedgehog into Google, until a couple of years ago, you would have a very safe bet where you probably only ever see pictures of European hedgehog. Although, however, now because of the increase in uh, the pet trade, see quite a lot of articles and information about the African pygmy hedgehog. Similarly, if you ever typed in hedgehog diet into Google, you'll get a bit of a mix of information between the two species. So that's why it's always really important to, um, to clarify you're looking at the European hedgehog because they eat slightly different things. They're in a different genus. So that means they are genetically very different, um, but related at the same time. So our European hedgehog only find that in Western Europe. Of course, it's a protected species in the UK, meaning you cannot keep it as a pet. And the adult weighs between about 600 to two kilograms. So it can be quite hefty. Whereas the African pygmy hedgehog is a domesticated variety of the four-toed hedgehog. So that's a, an African species that lives in the central African belt. And as a result, it tends to um, eat a lot more um, insect type food, whereas our hedgehog can cope with things, um, wetter things like fruits and things like that. So the pygmy hedgehog is very, very popular in the pet trade. I, uh, and, and often people in the media who don't uh, know their hedgehogs very well will quite often use pictures of pygmy hedgehogs when they're doing articles about British hedgehogs. I know the Guardian did it last year and I had to write to them being like, this isn't the wrong hedgehog. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's easy to see how they can, uh, how they can get confused. But the, um, the pygmy hedgehog is a lot smaller because they're pet size. Quite often they can uh, fit into the palm of your hand an adult pygmy hedgehog. So our species is a lot bigger. And of course you can't keep that as a pet. So, Having a little closer look at our hedgehog, I like this picture because it shows the lovely long legs. So we have obviously the lovely spiny coat, nice dark face on our hedgehog. So it's a nice honey brown color sort of on its fleur, but then on its face, quite dark brown. It actually has quite long limbs. I know they keep them hidden underneath all their spines, but a hedgehog's legs are actually quite long. And when they want to, they can be quite fast runners and very agile climbers. So because they do a lot of digging and foraging, their muscles for their forelegs are incredibly strong and they can actually push themselves up things like stairs and gates. I've seen a hedgehog climb over a fence. They're fantastic animals, very, uh, um, very, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word now, um, but they, they, take a lot of, um, they take a lot of hitting. So because of their, their ball, their spiny balls also acts as a cushion. So even when they climb and they fall off, they've got a lovely protective spiny coat that sort of absorbs the energy whenever they fall. So they also have a furry skirt and this skirt sometimes gets missed off a lot of the, um, a lot of the drawings and cartoons of hedgehogs because it doesn't go spines to skin. It goes spines, furry skirt, and then the under fur underneath. And so this furry skirt sort of, um, when the animal is pulled into its ball, this furry skirt keeps a lot of the dirt and stuff out of, out of the ball. And it's also nice and warm for the hedgehog as well. And then another thing that we very rarely see, hedgehogs do have a tail. It's hidden under there, under its little spines. So we call this a skirt or the hedgehog, um, 
we talk about it in a sort of skirt manner um, because the, the hedgehog is actually covered in a muscly sheath. So if we look at this cross section of a hedgehog here, this large area across the top here, that's a thick layer of muscle. And this muscle goes all the way around the hedgehog. And it looks a little bit like this. So we have two muscles, called one called the paniculus canosus, which is the one straight underneath the skin. This is the, the, um, this is the muscle that helps um, tense up the, uh, the spines on the, on the hedgehog, on the hedgehog as it as it starts to pull round. But then we also have the orbicularis muscle, which is uh, um, sort of underneath the paniculus callosus, and it really helps everything pull in. So the paniculus canosus starts helps the hedgehog pull itself in, and then the orbicularis sort of tightens things up a bit like a drawstring bag. So we have here when the hedgehog is nice and relaxed. If you imagine a drawstring bag, it's just nice and floppy. Then when it starts to get a little bit threatened, it'll start to tuck up. So if you imagine you pulling that drawstring, starting to get a little bit tight. And then once a hedgehog is in full defensive posture, it tucks its head and its limbs into the body. And these muscles help with that. So it's got a nice, uh, um, it's got a nice flexible neck, flexible vertebra that helps it bring itself all in. And then you imagine, fully pulling a drawstring bag. There's no way you can get anything in there. And um, so it looks a little bit like this. So when a hedgehog is fully, fully together and curled up, you shouldn't be able to see any of its feet or any of its delicate features. And so it's this strategy, this protection that has meant that hedgehogs have been able to stay the same body shape for such a long time. It's clearly a very, very successful strategy. Although sometimes, if you eat too much, it's not a very successful strategy. I thought I'd put this picture in. This is one of my foster hedgehogs who actually was enjoying life in captivity so much that he got too fat to roll up properly. And so, as you can see, he's trying to be defensive here, but because he's so chubby, he can't fit any of his most delicate bits in. And so we had to put him on a little diet before he got released. And another thing I'd like to point out with hedgehogs, quite a lot of people say, oh, look, a cute little belly button. And uh, this, this isn't a belly button. This is, this is just a boy hedgehog. So that's something else to keep in mind is if you see a hedgehog's belly button, it's not a belly button. <laughs> so this ball, uh, ball defense posture is uh, very unique to hedgehogs. No other animal um, uses this strategy. So the spines, are a very, very important part of a hedgehog's defense because it not only protects it from external environments, so predators, but the interlocking spines also act as a absorbing energy cushion. So like I said before, if the hedgehog's feeling particularly adventurous and decides to climb up some stairs and fall down, if it pulls itself into the ball, the interlocking spines act as a energy cushion, almost like a cyclist's helmet, protecting the hedgehog as it goes rolling down the stairs. Um, this is a lovely picture um, of Spud the Hedgehog, who used to live at Tiggy Winkle's Wildlife Hospital. I'd like to think that he's still there, but he had a little bit of a skin condition that meant that he lost all of his hair and all of his spines. So the fur on a hedgehog and the spines, they are both made out of keratin. So that's the protein that makes our fingernails and makes our hair. The keratin in hedgehog spines is obviously a little bit different, but it's made of the same stuff. So unfortunately, if you have some sort of alopecia type problem like poor Spud here, you end up naked, poor naked hedgehog. But um, that's very, very unusual. And of course we don't see this in nature very often because a hedgehog as vulnerable as this would be uh, very um, quick to be predated, shall we say. And they're not always dark brown either. So this is a picture that was posted, I think literally this morning, on the West Wales Hedgehog Rescue Facebook page. And I had to put it in because I thought it was fantastic. This is what we think is possibly an albino hedgehog or an incredibly leucistic hedgehog. So albinism is, the, um, is where the gene for color doesn't exist. So that means that a true albino animal um, has no pigment whatsoever and then has the red eyes as well. So the red eyes is classic albinism, whereas leucism is where you have sort of patches of lost pigment. 
So you can often see splotchiness or um, quite a, a lighter colour. So around where we live, we have quite a lot of eucystic red kites. So those are kites um, that don't have the normal red colouring. They just look a lot paler. But we think that this one is a, is a true albino, which is very, very rare um, to find. Although, because hedgehogs use their spines as, as defence, albinism doesn't necessarily affect hedgehogs as negatively as it would um, another animal who, say, uses camouflage as its form of defence. Obviously, that would make the hedgehog very, very noticeable, but those spines should protect it in the wild. So I'm hoping that this one will be released as usual. So if we think about a hedgehog and think about a hedgehog's year, most of its main activity happens in the spring and the summer months. So hibernation tends to occur in the winter, again, depending on temperature and the weather really, but generally from about November to the end of February, hedgehogs tend to be asleep or at least much less active. Around this time of year, May, they've all woken up now and they're starting to get, get busy trying to find mates um, for the breeding season, which is just about to start. And so in about a month's time, I would expect to see the first baby hedgehogs coming out. So breeding occurs from about um, the start of April through to September. Um, I'm sure you imagine, oh goodness, how on earth, how on earth do hedgehogs mate? Well, they mate in the usual sort of animal style, but the, the female actually relaxes her spines on the back to allow the, the male to, uh, to climb aboard, shall we say. So thinking about that muscle sheath underneath the skin, the hedgehog is able to move and erect its spines on different parts of its body, depending on, um, on what's happening around it. Quite often, if you come across a hedgehog, um, they don't have a sort of fight or flight. They sort of just freeze, F fight, flight or freeze. And hedgehogs definitely freeze. But what they will do if you disturb a hedgehog is they'll start bringing their spines up overneath their face. And so the first thing they do is dip their face in and bring their spines up. So when a female is mating with a male hedgehog, she, uh, she treats him kindly and relaxes her back so he doesn't get impaled in the, in the private parts. And um, uh, once the female is pregnant, she uh, starts making a nest out of moss and dried leaves. So this is a lovely picture of a female out during the day gathering things for her nest. So this is the time of year when you would expect to see hedgehogs out during the day. It's generally an adult female gathering things for her nest or feeding herself during the day because she hasn't had time to do it during the night because she's taking care of the kids. Um, and hedgehogs have about four to five babies per litter and they're born with very soft spines. So, but spines nevertheless, um, very, very soft. They don't tend to get spiky until the animal is about four or five weeks old. And so a hedgehog mum will keep these babies in the nest and they're completely vulnerable they need to be toileted. So that means they can't go to the toilet by themselves. Mum has to help them. And they live on the mum's milk, which of course all mammals do as, uh, as, as, as you know. Uh, I love this picture. Lovely little pink little baby hedgehogs here in the nest with mum. And so these hedgehogs, they tend to be independent at around six weeks of age, although they will accompany mum for foraging trips once they are weaned. And so, that means you sometimes will get a little gang of hedgehogs hanging around together. So that's often a family group wandering around. And then in sort of um, autumn time, we're thinking about late September, um, sorry, late August, early September, the juveniles will start to disperse out of their parents' territory. So their parents essentially kick them out. And that's when uh, all of the animals, so all of the hedgehogs that were born that year and the adults as well, they all start trying to gain weight ready for hibernation in the winter. Of course, that's a really important part of the hedgehog's life cycle. And so eating is extremely important. Now, when it comes to the hedgehog diet, there has been some studies done, but as you can see from the, uh, the citation at the bottom, it hasn't been done for a very, very long time. Now, because hedgehogs have a lot of um, versatility in their diet and it's quite regional depending on where they are. And of course, during the time of year as well, the, um, quite a lot of the data that we get does depend on seasonality. But one thing that I do find very interesting is that in all studies, it's shown that hedgehogs actually prefer hard shelled animals. So you think, oh, what do hedgehogs eat? Slugs and snails. Well, we actually found that 
beetles and earwigs and things like caterpillars and moth larvae tend to make up a much larger proportion of their diet when it compared to slugs and snails. And we think that is because um, the earwigs and the beetles, they're actually full of a lot more protein and things like that. Um, same with the caterpillars, they're a, lot a bit more nutritious than a slug or a snail. Um, but they will also eat um, anything that they can get their hands on. So like I said before, hedgehogs have become a bit of a pest in places like New Zealand and up in the Scottish Highlands because they eat eggs of ground nesting birds. And so they'll eat the eggs and they'll also eat the shells for the calcium as well. And they will take a, a baby bird if it's vulnerable on the ground. There are clips on YouTube if you're brave enough to go and look for them. But yes, yeah, so a hedgehog will eat pretty much anything. Their diet is, is pretty Catholic. It's mostly invertebrates, but again, it has to do with seasonal, seasonal variation. But when it comes to their habitat requirements, hedgehogs, well, our species of hedgehog are pretty standard. So they like things like hedgerows, of course, they like ground level linear features. Now, because hedgehogs don't have very good eyesight, they tend to use, um, they tend to just map things um, on their level. So they like ground level linear features. So that's why hedgerows are a really important factor for them because they use that in order to uh, navigate their way around their territory. And the dense undergrowth as well. So if we think about, it's not just providing the hedgehog with safety and security, it's also providing um, a habitat for invertebrates and the things that hedgehogs want to eat. So a large territory of, for a hedgehog is about two kilometers. It can be bigger, can be smaller. Again, depends on the habitat, how, how good the habitat is, how, how, um, how, many, how many insects they can find in, in the area. Because obviously if it's, if it's a bit poor of a quality, the territory will be larger. And then if it's a really good quality habitat, then the territories tend to be a little bit smaller. And the most important thing that is that we have for hedgehogs, I suppose, is the connecting corridors between these um, these elements of um, of different features. So um, the connecting corridors, I'm sure you hear quite a lot, is uh, things like hedgerows. So um, sorry, whoops, things like hedgerows that are super important because hedgehogs are hedge hogs. They do tend to hog the hedge, as it were. They can get incredibly defensive and territorial when it comes to defending their patch and so that is one of the reasons why we're facing such a decline of our hedgehogs because they uh, they tend to push each other out of well um, of good good quality territory and good quality habitat so that's why it's really important to have lots of available habitat for them to go so things things like gardens that are linked up that's something that's really really important so if we look at the hedgehog distribution map for, for Britain, we have um, sort of widespread all over the place. As you can see, it's sort of not very, um, not very many uh, hedgehogs in the sort of upland areas. Anywhere where you have um, mountains, they tend not to like, um, tend to like lowland areas. So anything um, with a bit of woodland um, or farmland or anything like that. But unfortunately, we are facing a decline of the animals, obviously, as, as you all know, and that's for a variety of reasons. So there's not just one single reason why hedgehogs are declining. It's a mixture of factors, including things like habitat loss, the fragmentation of um, remaining rural environments, increasing urbanization. So that's not just where people are, it's the, uh, it's the urbanization of that habitat, it's tarmac and fake grass and all of those sorts of things as well as things like pesticides, and that's both used in, um, on agricultural land, but then also in our gardens as well. Things like slug pellets are incredibly, incredibly dangerous to hedgehogs. And then of course we have human activity, yay! And so obviously humans, with um, we tend not to be very wildlife focused in how we live our lives. So things like driving our cars, using power tools, all of these things tend to impact on hedgehogs and other wildlife quite negatively. Um, sorry, I'm just going to click. I'm just going to get rid of that. There we go. So if we think about um, a, a sort of rural environment, for example, if we think about all of the potential connections that can be made. So we've got quite a lot of bare ground here in terms of the uh, in terms of the fields and the agriculture. But if we think like a hedgehog and we use all of the corridors, we can actually 
put together a large map. And so something like this would be, say, a hedgehog's route around their territory, for example. And of course, in an ideal world, that's fantastic and wouldn't be a problem. But unfortunately, humans just can't let anything be. And we do a lot of mucking around in the rural environment. And it's not just about um, what we do. So hedgehogs are already facing issues with natural barriers from things like streams and stuff, and they're evolved to cope with that. But what they're not evolved to cope with is mass um, vegetation removal, is hedgerow removal, and they are very not evolved to deal with fences. And so fences um, are a hedgehog's number one enemy, I think, because that not only um, prevents, it quite often means that you've lost a hedgerow by putting in a fence, but it also means that the hedgehog is then unable to access different parts of its territory. And this can mean that populations become isolated, certain individuals can't meet and breed, and therefore you end up with um, fragmentations of populations that just sort of die out um, as, as things go forward. Now, one threat that we do have to badgers in rural populations, uh, threat, threat to badgers, threat to hedgehogs in rural populations is, head, is, oh my goodness me, badgers are a threat to hedgehogs, goodness. So, because they are the only mammal um, that we have that are capable of predating a healthy hedgehog, that spiny coat is so useful that it's only a badger with its super long claws that can actually um, kill and predate a, a healthy adult hedgehog. Although this doesn't happen very often as um, badgers tend to be a lot more insect based on their diet, but it, but it can happen when territories overlap. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen the decline in hedgehogs just as we've seen an increase in badger numbers. And quite often this can be conflated as a causation, but it, it very much isn't. There's a, there's a lot of multiple things happening here. So for example, like food competition, because badgers and hedgehogs tend to eat the same things, that means that they will compete with each other for the same food. Similarly for habitat. So a good territory with good insects is gonna, is gonna, um, is gonna attract all of the animals. So anything that eats good insects is gonna want to come to that area. And so of course, then when they're pla placed, placed in close contact with each other, they're more likely to, to have issues. And so that's why if you have badgers, they're more likely to affect populations at a very, very local level as opposed to national. So that is why I would always say that culling badgers will never help hedgehogs in any way. Badgers and hedgehogs have lived together side by side for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and have been completely fine up until very, very recently. And it's human activity mostly and those driving factors of habitat loss and rural fragmentation that have meant that now badgers and hedgehogs are starting to clash because they both want the same things. And sadly, we've made it so that um, it's become a lot more difficult to get because it's not just in rural areas either. If we think about our urban spaces or semi-urban spaces, things like roads, fences, canals, even houses without suitable corridors, they can all prove deathly to a hedgehog population. So for example, because they can happen so fast. So uh, a new road can be installed within months, a fence within a day. And that's something that can affect a hedgehog population almost instantly, and they can't necessarily recover from that. However, it is not all bad news. <laughs> I must say that it's definitely not all bad news. Although quite a lot of surveys will indicate that in rural areas, hedgehog numbers are declining and they're still declining. In urban areas, we're actually finding an increase in hedgehog numbers in certain places. Um, and now we think that this has been down to um, a lot of work about um, raising awareness of hedgehogs, about um, their decline and their needs in terms of what we can do in our gardens. But it just goes to show how important urban areas are for wild animals, because with, um, with the rural fragmentation as it is, it could be the urban gardens and green corridors could be the last lifeline for hedgehogs and they actually become a bit more of an urban species than a rural one. And I find this really, really interesting from an animal behaviorist perspective. I, I think this is fantastic. And so when I was finished with university and I didn't, uh, I needed something to fill my time, I started uh, the Avarice with Hedgehog project. 
um, specifically because Aberystwyth is a very interesting place in terms of urban and rural mix. It's a very dense urban center compared to the rural belt around it. And I guess I was interested in collecting records um, about hedgehogs and where they are and sort of where they're going. And so I did that with a mixture of um, chatting to people. I did a few public engagement talks like what I'm doing today, um, but mostly it was about collecting records. And so over the, and promoting Hedgehog Street, of course, which is the British, Preserva British Hedgehog Preservation's key hedgehog um, conservation project. So Hedgehog Street has been fantastic and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And so what I was recording, I was talking to people on Facebook and just in the street about what sorts of things that they'd found, because it's not just live sightings that I was interested in. It was any sightings of hedgehogs at all. So that's including roadkill, any field signs or things like poop or footprints. So I did a few footprint tunnel surveys. And we were able to identify a couple of hedgehogs that way. Then also video footage um, from things like camera traps or anything like that. And so obviously, obviously live sightings are obviously fantastic. And that's sort of what spurred me on to start the project really is because I found these two hedgehogs getting, uh, getting heated at the back of my garden. Um, and I was really, really happy to see that we had two hedgehogs, uh, but before then I, I, had, I had no idea that they were there. And so that's sort of what um, inspired me to, I, sent, I, I guess, go looking for them. Because when I looked on the official records, um, there hadn't been that many, but clearly we have quite a good population in Aberystwyth and I wanted to record that. Similarly with field signs, this is a lovely example of a hedgehog poo. So even though you've not seen the hedgehog, if you find a fresh poo, that's as good as, that's almost as good as seeing it. As long as you know it's definitely a hedgehog poo, you know you've got hedgehogs in the area. And so their poo tends to be quite dark and when it's dry, it tends to be quite shiny because they like to eat all of those hard shelled insects so things like the beetles the earwigs all of those indigestible um, wing cases and things like that just come out in the poo and it doesn't tend to not well wild hedgehog poo doesn't tell tend to smell that bad it's only when they get into care and they get on the cat food that their poo starts to smell but naturally hedgehog poo doesn't really smell all that bad and tends to be quite dry in consistency and so i did a lot of footprint tunnel surveys around aberystwyth as well so that's me um leading the Penn Park Eye Wildlife Group out on a footprint tunnel survey. And I found this a fantastic way to not only survey for hedgehogs, but to sort of look for what other animals are in the area. So this is a really, really simple and cheap way of surveying for animals. You can just use one tunnel, but what we did was use a series of 10 different tunnels over a kilometer to sort of um, try and catch a hedgehog if we could find it. So here we have a tunnel here. It's just a piece of folded plastic with another piece of plastic that you slide in the middle. And on there, you have a little ink pad, which is made of non-toxic powder paint. And you have a bit of bait in the middle. Ignore the mealworms. We'll get onto that in a minute. Um, and some plain paper there for the hedgehog to, uh, to pass across. So the idea is, is that the hedgehog passes across the ink pad to get to the food, eats the food, and then on its way out, it will leave you a nice set of footprints on the way back. And so what footprints we're looking for is lovely five toed footprints. Sometimes on the four foot, they only show four toes, but hedgehogs show five feet, five feet, five toes generally. Um, and that's, uh, that's how you can tell the difference between um, a cat or a dog as they only show four. So something like, so hedgehogs are five toes. And I think they tend to look like little high fives. And so depending on how much paint you put on your pad depends on how strong your footprints are going to be. And so even though these are quite faint, I can still tell that they're hedgehogs because they look like little human high fives that someone's done all over the little all over the page there. What I like about this one as well is you can also see some slight marking that looks like brush strokes. And that's where the furry skirt has gotten some paint on it and it's gone washed over the, the page on, on the way out. And so. I thought that was quite sweet. Obviously, sometimes hedgehogs just don't want to play ball. And so that's why uh, in the early days, I like to do a mixture of both um, camera trapping and footprint tunnel surveying, because sometimes the hedgehogs, they just don't want to comply. Um, and then sometimes they do and they upset the neighbors. And this is one of my favorite clips of <laughs> a hedgehog perturbing one of our local neighborhood cats. But on a 
So that's what your footprint tunnel should like look, should look like with hedgehog in situ. As that hedgehog leaves the tunnel, it's going to leave a nice lot of inky footprints on the paper, and we're left with something that looks a little bit like this. So again, depending on how much ink you put on your pad depends on how clear the footprints are going to be. And even though they're not very clear because of the size, the shape, little high fives, I can tell that these are hedgehog. And so there are quite a lot of different resources that you can get for footprint tunnels. You can download footprint cheat sheets. This is one that I've got from the Mammal Society. Um, on the Aberyst with face, uh, Hedgehog Facebook page as well, there's also downloads available of examples that um, we've got from our footprint tunnels as well. So this is a picture that I got off the internet. So this is when, when, when you have instructions on how to do a footprint tunnel, they're like, it looks like this. And this is a fantastic example. So you can see, you can see the pad, you can see all of the toes, properly looks like a little human hand. But that's a very, very good example. And more often than not, you'll get results that look a little bit like this. So don't be disheartened. You're looking for that little high five. So that's five toes for a hedgehog. And again, looks like a human hand. And so after a couple of years of doing various uh, surveys and collecting records, this is, um, this is the spread of records that I got for around um, Aberystwyth and North Ceredigion. So I tried to um, categorize them in terms of the type of record. Um, the majority, unfortunately, were, um, no, the majority were, yeah, no, sorry. It turned out to be the, the vast amount of records were from roadkill, which doesn't necessarily mean that there are a lot of roadkill. It just means that people see that more often. But then also we've got quite a few live sightings. Quite a few of those live sightings were animals that then had to go on to rescue. And we also found a couple of different field signs and things like that. So if we zoom in onto Aberystwyth, something that I thought was very interesting and both confirmed, I suppose, what I thought was the case, but I was able to identify some roadkill hotspots as well. So up here, specifically around Commons Coch, this is a dead zone for a lot of different things. So hedgehogs, rabbits, unfortunately, people as well. So I think this might be something that we can get onto the council about to chat about maybe reducing the speed limit in that area or something similar that can benefit both the hedgehogs and the people as well. So I stopped collecting records last year when uh, COVID happened and I wasn't able to do my, my, my footprint surveys. Um, I sort of rethought about what I wanted to do with the project. And so now instead of taking records myself, what I'm trying to get people to do is to log them themselves on Hedgehog Street, because when I, things have changed quite a lot and quite a lot of people now know a lot more about Hedgehog Street than they did when I first started my project. So now I'm trying to promote Hedgehog Street as much as I can. Um, and on this website, you can promote, you can log um, your sightings and you can also log your hedgehog hole. So these are little gaps that you can pop in your fence or your garden wall, something that, that is just small enough for a hedgehog to get through. So we're thinking anything about 13 centimeters square. So that's about the size of a CD case. So if anyone's still got CDs, it's about that size there. You can get templates online as well. And it doesn't have to be square, it can be circular. I love this one, it's used a little bit of pipe. But all of these gaps are very, very important. As, uh, as I said before, connecting corridors is something that's very, very important to hedgehogs so that they can use as much of, uh, of the area as they can and that, so that they can interact with each other along the way. So Hedgehog Street, again, that's something that's really, really important and that I would 100% I would promote um, if you can. I put the, uh, the link at the end of the presentation for you. So there are quite a lot of things that you can do in your garden to help hedgehogs, adding feeding stations or places where they can hibernate both naturally and artificially is something that they will appreciate. So natural nests are generally just a big ball of dry leaves. And so come the autumn, it's a really good idea to maybe um, put all of the dry leaves in one area of your garden and sort of just leave that area there. They tend not to like disturbance so much. So what I tend to do is just sort of leave an area and if a hedgehog is going to be in there then that's fine I don't need to necessarily know about it and so when it comes to feeding hedgehogs there are a couple of good good things and bad things when it comes to water fresh water 100% if you can't feed always put out fresh water because that will both help hedgehogs as well as all other wildlife in your garden so birds and everything else 
they like meaty cat food. So I tend to stick with the more meaty varieties like chicken and stuff. Some people say that they don't like fish, although I find a, hundred, a hungry hedgehog will eat pretty much anything. And if you don't want to put out um, meaty cat food, things like kitty kibble or um, branded hedgehog foods will, will also work. I found branded hedgehog foods tend to be very, very expensive, but cats don't eat them. So it's a bit of a toss up. If you've got quite a lot of cats in your area and you don't want them eating all your hedgehog bait, then, uh, then maybe a hedgehog food is something that you can, you can buy. Might be, might be worth the money if the cats keep eating all your bait. But there are a couple of things that are definitely no-nos for hedgehogs. So this includes things that were sometimes promoted in the past. So you heard me mention mealworms beforehand. So mealworms is something that we used to actively promote as something to feed hedgehogs. However, we now know that because of the, the makeup of um, the relationship between the phosphorus and the calcium within the food and within the hedgehog, these poor quality foods actually end up leaching calcium from the hedgehog's bones. And so they end up with really long term problems like osteoporosis and will often end up dying quite early in life because of a poor quality diet. So all of these feed items are off limits. So no mealworms, no bird food like peanuts and sunflower hearts. It doesn't matter if a hedgehog eats a little bit underneath the bird table, that's fine. But don't put out an entire dish of peanuts just for your hedgehog. Same with bread and milk. I know quite a lot of people I've spoken to, especially of the older generation, say, oh, put a bit of bread and milk out for the hedgehog. You'll most likely give your hedgehog a bit of a, a, bit of a sore tummy if you did that, because they're actually a bit lactose intolerant. So bread and milk, although it won't kill them, it will give them a bit of a, a sore tummy. So stick with the meaty foods and um, fresh water if you can, of course. And if you've got something like a food box that you want to feed your hedgehog in, it's always worth putting in a bit of a baffle. So this is something to prevent cats from accessing your box. So a nice um, elbow shaped uh, thing for baffle so that the cats can't come in and eat all your hedgehog food. <laughs> and there are lots of other things that you can do in your garden if you're not if you're not up to feeding hedgehogs even just leaving areas of your garden wild will benefit hedgehogs because even if they're not nesting there or using that area to hibernate they will be using that area to forage so things like decaying wood especially is really good for these hard shelled beetles and earwigs and things like that that hedgehogs really really like so decaying wood is particularly something that they like when it comes to ponds as well, if you're lucky enough to have a pond, it's really um, th worth thinking about having a little ladder for something to get out. Because although hedgehogs can swim, um, they, uh, they do sometimes end up with problems in ponds. As you can see in this one, there seems to be at least a foot between the top of the water and the actual pond edge. So something even just like a little pond ladder can help hedgehogs amazingly. Similarly, not using pesticides in your garden. So that's things like slug pellets, snail pellets, or any herb sprayed herbicides. That's another way that um, you can help hedgehogs because indirectly, there's more insects for hedgehogs to eat. And I suppose directly, slug pellets can be fatal to hedgehogs. And so if a hedgehog accidentally eats the slug pellets or eats a slug that has eaten the slug pellets, it will quite often die, unfortunately. So that's why slug pellets are absolutely banned in my garden and I will not use them. <laughs> On a similar gardening note, strimmers and power tools is another thing that is causing problems with hedgehogs. So because they tend to, they tend to freeze, they don't run away when it comes to danger, they, they freeze and they curl up. That means that um, quite often with strimmers, they end up um, injured because they won't run away. And so whenever you're doing strimming work, it's always worth having a good look in the area where you're going to strim beforehand. And 100% never ever strim in an area just by plonking your strimmer head in. Because that tends to be how hedgehogs end up with little accidents, unfortunately. So like I was saying about the, um, about the resources in terms of Hedgehog Street, the um, British Hedgehog Preservation Society has so much information on their website. They have leaflets that you can download. They have links to lots of other resources, um, initiatives for um, uh, hedgehog um, care, sorry, hedgehog um, groundskeeping awards. So if you're, um, if you're, say, a groundskeeper of, I don't know, a, uh, a local field or a sports team, you can, you can apply for accredited status to show that you are um, protecting hedgehogs and you're doing everything that you can to promote them in your green space. 
If you want to get a bit more scientific about it, the People's Trust for Endangered Species um, deals with a lot of the data when it comes to hedgehogs. So that lovely big UK distribution map is from one of their reports. They tend to put out um, a, uh, a report every, every couple of years called the State of Britain's Hedgehogs. I think the last one was in 2018, but there was one in 2016 and 2015, and you can download all of them from their website. And that gives a bit more of an in-depth look into the data that they've been collecting and what that means for hedgehogs around Britain. And then, of course, when it comes to hedgehog rescue, um, here are two numbers of, I think, the most local rescues to, to us in Ceredigion. So we've got West Wales Hedgehog Rescue that Di O'Keefe runs out of Lampeter, and she is absolutely amazing. And now I used, I used to help Di out with a bit of um, fostering and, and care. And so I can I vouch for her 100%. She's fantastic. But if you're a bit more south and um, a bit more close to Cardigan, then Hedgley Hedgehog Rescue is another one. You can find both of these on Facebook if you're so inclined, but um, I will leave the numbers. I can put the numbers up in the question time as well for, um, for, for you to write down there. So I know I've talked incredibly fast and I've talked about in lots of different things, but thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs>